This is for anyone who may be taken aback by my comments. I don't really care if you are. I hope you are. For years now, it has been, you know, two and a half years since he officially entered the political arena. Donald Trump, congratulations. You have made this country a land where sleaze is not just the language of politics, but the political environment itself. His supporters made excuses, continue to make excuses for him. You also might want to do some self-examination. What does it say about you that no matter what, you continue to make excuses for this man, for his vile behavior, this sort of vile behavior? Doesn't that make you just as bad, if not worse, than him? And for all of you who over the last few years have uttered that tired, lazy, uninformed, uneducated, ignorant response of calling me and others who point out racist behavior racist, you know what you can go do? Fuck Trump. We don't want to fucking hear from you. Get the fuck away from us. We don't want to fucking hear from you. We got nothing to fucking say to you. Get the fuck away from our Get his face. We don't want anything to do with you. You're a fucking smash. It's fucking over. The discourse is over. We have argued. We have pondered. The discourse is over. We're not going to be polite anymore. We're going to fight back. We begin with several developing stories here on a Friday night, first with violent and bloody clashes outside of Donald Trump event. Violent scuffles ensue, all of this becoming a part of a pattern of unrest fueled by antagonism and divisive rhetoric. Kelly Burke is charged with disorderly conduct. Investigators say she was screaming obscenities at a teenage girl, all because she was wearing a t-shirt supporting President Donald Trump. You're a piece of shit, bro! You're a fucking piece of shit! Why did he get his head taken by somebody who didn't like Donald Trump? Are you talking to the, the president? You ain't poor shit, nigga. Just make that hat great again and burn it right in the trash. Work and we are going to try to stop this. What we've got to do is fight in Congress, fight in the courts, fight in the streets. Donald Trump's campaign is surrounded by controversy this morning after a weekend of chaos and violence. It is a result of the culture of Trump supporters. We need a revolution. Are you suggesting that the entire Trump vote was racist and by racists? I think yes. I, I'm not I don't going think to. That was a Nazi. I've He's never. I, I'm not a Nazi. Oh, what are you doing, man? Hey. The people of color who are attacked by their fellow citizens who feel emboldened to be publicly racist. Because the president is. His supporters. What does it say about you? A terrifying night of violence as Donald Trump supporters were attacked by an angry mob waiting for them outside a Trump rally. What happened? This guy like sucker punched in the back of the head. You also might want to do some self-examination. Another fist fight's about to break out right now. Trump supporter is right now. One Trump supporter got knocked around when a fight broke out. Homeless woman confronted as she showed her support for Donald Trump and his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. You continue to make excuses for this man for his vile behavior. Doesn't that make you just as bad, if not worse? The protesters shaking cars, breaking taillights. The mob even followed the Trump supporters to their cars. We will punch some people in the face. Trump supporters harassed, beaten, and bloodied by mobs of protesters. Who ruled them? These are anti-Donald Trump protesters. No, he's he's leading bad. Pressure, pressure, no, he's leading bad. He's leading bad. He's leading bad. He's leading bad. Man viciously beaten, all because he voted for Donald Trump. Oh shit, he's bleeding. Yo, yo, yo. This is tough stuff. We're fighting a war. No Trump, no wall. No USA at all. No Trump, no wall. No USA at all. No Trump, no wall. No USA at all. We are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America.
Barack Obama had tried to fundamentally transform our country. And I didn't understand yet how far our country had gone, how much Obama had given away our nation. Taking a look at the labor force participation rate, it's the lowest it's been in decades and has been on a steady decline during the Obama presidency. Where the country was before Trump got into this race was it was a dismal economy. We're still living on the Obama economy and we're in the worst shape we've been at in the entire post-World War II period. Unemployment was high, people were downtrodden, people were disappointed, and we became the laughing stock of the foreign policy world because we had an American president who was an apologist for leading the greatest country in the world. And what we saw was this president go overseas and start bowing to foreign leaders and being apologetic for having the greatest superpower the world has ever seen. What we needed was not a litigator, we needed a fighter. We needed someone that understood this is a cultural war, that the left wants to undo our country. They want to take down America. No Trump, no wall, no USA at all. No Trump, no wall, no USA at all. No Trump, no wall, no USA at all. No Trump, no wall. Donald Trump said, not on my watch. Now is the time to fight, and Donald Trump was the man to do it. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't have them. When was the last time anybody saw us beating China? When did we beat Japan at anything. When do we beat Mexico at the border? They're laughing at us, at our stupidity. The U.S. has become a dumping ground for everybody else's problems. The world right now is going, whites are black, Trump's running for president, like, <laughs> does gravity still work? You're not going to be president, all right? Folks, Donald Trump is not a serious person. That he might be leaving the Republican ticket next year. <laughs> I know you don't believe that, but I want to go on. <laughs> Let's not mince words. Donald Trump is a bigot and a racist. I'm sorry, he's a racist. He's a belligerent, loudmouth racist. There is zero chance we'll be seeing you being sworn in on the Capitol steps with your hand on a giant golden Bible. The very first thing I noticed about Donald Trump was when he came down the escalator and he said, I'm rich. I'm really rich. I'll show you that in a second. And by the way, I'm not even saying that in a brag. That's the kind of mindset, that's the kind of thinking you need for this country. I'm very, 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 very rich. <laughs> and I want to show you how to get rich with me. I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. So this began as 500 people in a ballroom oh, in Phoenix. Oh, and the hotel called us up. And they said, please don't do it here. We're going to be swamped. It's going to destroy the building. And we will make America great again. It's been amazing. And outside, sadly, we have thousands of people that can't get in. So you know real estate. You know real estate. We're going to do it. I love you all. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. I love you. We're going to do it. I think in the primaries, the candidates that were fielded by the Republican Party, it was the best group of candidates that I've ever seen run for the Republican nomination. And it's one that Trump was able to dispense with very quickly and I think very easily. And that's because he connected to voters in a way that they didn't. I was told by everybody, do not go to Iowa. You could never finish even in the top 10. <laughs> And I said, but I have friends in Iowa. I know a lot of people in Iowa. I think they'll really like me. Let's give it a shot. They said, don't do it. I said, I have to do it. And 
We finished second, and I want to tell you something. I'm just honored. I'm really honored. And there's a reason his support collapsed in the final days. You look at all the entrance polls, people decided the last week, last two days, last day. They went to Rubio and Cruz. Donald Trump is a here today, gone tomorrow candidate for president. Fox News can now project that Donald Trump will win the Republican presidential primary. Because as entertaining as Donald Trump is, Donald Trump is a liar. And which Republican candidate <clears throat> has the best chance of winning the general election? Of the declared ones right now, Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump, the billionaire real estate magnate, will win the South Carolina Republican primary. There's not going to be a President Donald Trump. And CBS News is projecting that Donald Trump is the winner in the state of Florida. So here you have two sides within the same party battling over who's going to be right when this is all over. Your words were, among Hispanics generally, Trump polls only slightly better than cancer. Well, I mean, at least it's slightly better, right? Trump claimed big wins in the South, a 22-point margin in Alabama, 14-point victories in Tennessee and Georgia, with tighter wins in Arkansas and Virginia. The RNC has booted National Review from co-sponsoring the Republican debate next month. This after the conservative magazine assembled a group of prominent pundits with a single goal, stopping Donald Trump. Donald Trump will never be elected president of the United States. He is not a typical politician. Fans were flooding Trump events, turning out in record numbers. People there were groupies. They would go to 7, 10, 15, 30 rallies. They'd travel around the country to see him. They would wait in line for 8, 9, 10 hours in the rain, in the snow. This evening, his last opponent dropped out. Trump is the Republican Party's presumptive nominee for president. Donald Trump is, in fact, the party's presumptive nominee. And I could not be more proud tonight to present to you and to all of America my father and our next president, Donald J. Trump. convention occurs at a moment of crisis for our nation. The attacks on our police and the terrorism of our cities threaten our very way of life. Any politician who does not grasp this danger is not fit to lead our country. The crime and violence that today afflicts our nation will soon, and I mean very soon, come to an end. Beginning on January 20th of 2017, safety will be restored. What about our economy? Again, I will tell you the plain facts that have been edited out of your nightly news and your morning newspaper. Nearly four in 10 African-American children are living in poverty, while 58% of African-American youth are now not employed. Two million more Latinos are in poverty today than when President Obama took his oath of office less than eight years ago. Another 14 million people have left the workforce entirely. The most important difference between our plan and that of our opponent is that our plan will put America first. Americanism, not globalism, will be our credo. The American people will come first once again. Big business, elite media, and major donors are lining up behind the campaign of my opponent because they know she will keep our rigged system in place. My message is that things have to change, and they have to change right now. Every day, I wake up determined to deliver a better life for the people all across this nation that have been ignored, neglected, and abandoned. I have visited the laid-off factory workers, 
and the communities crushed by our horrible and unfair trade deals. These are the forgotten men and women of our country, and they are forgotten, but they're not going to be forgotten long. These are people who work hard, but no longer have a voice. I am your voice. Unlike the massive crowd at the Trump rally, only 600 people showed up for Hillary Clinton's rally last night in Iowa. I knew things were changing because I would see the rallies in Ohio and Michigan and Pennsylvania. It's supposed to be a blue wall. I thought Donald Trump was one of the first politicians in a while who looked at voters and saw them as real people in concrete situations, people with real everyday problems, and who saw them as his fellow Americans. He kind of looked at them as part of a national family. That's Donald Trump reminding the people of where it used to be a better country, where we had manufacturing, where guys who worked in steel mills and coal plants were heroes of our country and now under the Obama years those jobs were decimated and he promised to bring those manufacturing jobs back because middle America had been left behind. Today on a very complicated and very difficult subject you will get the truth. The fundamental problem with the immigration system in our country is that it serves the needs of wealthy donors political activists, and powerful, powerful politicians. Let me tell you who it does not serve. It does not serve you, the American people. It doesn't serve you. Illegal immigration costs our country more than $113 billion a year. Most illegal immigrants are lower skilled workers with less education who compete directly against vulnerable American workers. Only the out of touch media elites think the biggest problem facing American society today is that there are 11 million illegal immigrants who don't have legal status. To all the politicians, donors, and special interests, hear these words from me and all of you today. There is only one core issue in the immigration debate, and that issue is the well-being of the American people. Build the wall. Build the wall. We will. Oh, we'll build it. We will build it. Who's going to pay for it? You can put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. When Hillary Clinton called our voters and our supporters deplorable, I think it helped change the dynamics of the entire race. So what does she get? out of criticizing a quarter of the country, presumably some of whom she'd love to have vote for her. We have the support of cops and soldiers, carpenters and welders, the young and the old, and millions of working class families who just want a better future and a good job. These were the people Hillary Clinton so viciously demonized. These were among the countless Americans that Hillary Clinton called deplorable. What Hillary Clinton has done here mm -hmm. is she, she's created a community. Our next guests are Trump supporters who are embracing the deplorable label. We wanted to show everybody that we're not deplorable. We're normal, middle-class women. We don't win, we lose. We are going to start winning again. We're going to win with everything. We're going to win so much. You are going to get so sick and tired of winning. I say this kiddingly, but I love saying it. You are going to get so tired of winning. 
you're going to say, please, please, Mr. President, we can't take it anymore. The people of New Mexico cannot take it. You're winning too much. We can't stand it. Please don't win so much. And I'm going to say, I'm sorry. We're going to keep winning. We are going to make America great again. New polls just out tonight nationally. Hillary Clinton after the first debate now, now at 47 to Donald Trump's 42. Clinton is polling now at 49%, Donald Trump at 44%. There comes a moment in every great endeavor when success or failure is determined by the decisions you make under duress at a seminal moment. Donald Trump's moment came in October. Billy Bush weekend was probably the most difficult weekend of the campaign. What was taking place at Trump Tower was the staff there was attempting to manage the president and come up with a solution. Some people told the president to get out of the race, and he was going to go down and have the biggest defeat in our history. But what I knew about Donald Trump was you never back down, you double down. That 2005 Access Hollywood tape wasn't just lewd remarks. Trump was literally explaining a time-tested strategy for sexual assault. The swing voters have been these college-educated white women who went for Mitt Romney by six points, and in our last poll, went for Hillary Clinton by 25 points. They last night saw nothing to bring them to Donald. Just, just, could I just cut through? I have one thing to say, one thing only. And that is that this race is over. Basically, this was just going to be a coronation now for Hillary Clinton, and Donald Trump had no shot. An estimated 20,000 people turned out last night at a football stadium in Mobile, Alabama. Trump, 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 Trump. NBC News Survey Monkey poll is out today. It puts Hillary Clinton up by 10 points over Donald Trump. The first exit polls come out, and the, the margin is so bad that it, there's basically not enough votes left to go and make it up. We're going to lose everything. And in CNN, you can feel the jubilation that the reporters are having. You know what we haven't had in a presidential election in a long time? A real landslide. And I don't want to oversell this here, but at least right now, in this moment, we're seeing an interesting possibility in this presidential race. It was funny because when I saw Florida come in and, and they refused to call it for Donald Trump, I knew at that moment that uh, CNN didn't want to call it because it would be the end of it all. The result of the election hasn't been officially uh, declared yet, so I, 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 go ahead, I'm sorry. I knew at that moment that the president had won. I did not think the swamp could be beaten. I did not think that the Hillary Clinton machine could be beaten. I did not think that Donald Trump would beat them. The biggest surprise of the night. But if I had to say secondary to that, it would definitely be the response of all the pundits and the pollsters as they saw their whole brand just melt around them when they were proven 100% false on everything that they had been saying for the last six months. And all of a sudden, by 10, 10, 30 at night, I know Trump's going to be the president-elect of the United States. And I've got to go back on CNN. And it was, a, it was an amazing feeling. You've won, so act like you've won. I, I, think, I think Donald Trump is going to go on tonight. I think he's waiting for Hillary Clinton to call him and concede this race. And then he's going to make a very gracious speech, which says, I want to be the president of the entire United States. I want to bring everyone together. I don't think it's outrageous for him. No way. candidate in modern American politics has ever run a wire-to-wire -wire first place campaign. We went in first place and we never looked back. We are going to make this decision now. The Fox News decision desk has called Pennsylvania for Donald Trump. This means that Donald Trump will be the 45th president of the United States. There are demonstrations in major American cities across the country tonight over the election of Donald Trump. Tens of thousands marched in streets across the United States on Saturday. Protests held in big cities such as Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago. But in Portland Saturday night, it turned violent.
people filling the streets in America's cities, protesting President-elect Donald Trump. Crowds set fires, blocked freeways, and gathered at Trump's buildings all across the country. You're awake, by the way. You're not having a terrible, terrible dream. Also, you're not dead and you haven't gone to hell. This is your life now. This is our election now. This is us. This is our country. It's real. Washington Post is now reporting that a secret CIA report concluded, quote, that Russia intervened in the 2016 election to help Donald Trump win the presidency. The most important thing to understand about what happened in 2016 is that it wasn't about a man, but it was about a message and a platform. Both left and right had betrayed the nation. The GOP didn't understand that Donald Trump won despite the Republican Party, not because of the Republican Party. When he took this country over on January 20th, 2017, we were in real trouble, and we still are. I attended the inauguration uh, with my wife, was going to become a citizen just a month later. She had never heard a politician speak like this, and she mentioned that this is going to be a presidency like we'd never seen before. And when you listen to that inauguration speech, you understood that he was getting ready to, for battle. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism, which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. And after that speech, we got a preview of exactly what the media was going to do in terms of coverage of Donald Trump in calling it dark, in evoking Nazism, in saying all the most horrible things that you can say about an inauguration speech. When he said today, America first, it was not just the racial, I mean, the, I should say racial, the Hitlerian uh, background to it. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. The media can't resist. Why can they always not resist uh, comparing uh, folks to Nazi Germany or Hitler? From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. We want to hear that message of America first. However, it carries with it overtones from the 1930s when an anti-Semitic movement saying we don't want to get involved in Europe's war. It's the Jews' fault in Germany. The words themselves carry very ugly echoes in our history. Finally, we must think big and dream even bigger. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining, but never doing anything about it. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. President Trump signing executive orders in his first few days in office. Just moments ago in the Oval Office, uh, as he did sign two executive orders, one to officially ease the burden on Obamacare. American worker hiring freeze except the military. What does that mean, Mark? Uh, Tamron, it's about, you know, saying that there should be no more civil servants in the federal government, that they're not going to grow the size of the government uh, with federal workers. What do you make of the signing of these executive orders and the president withdrawing the United States from TPP? Well, he's making good on a lot of campaign promises. What he's trying to do here is follow through on a promise to take uh, action on day one. We're going to move on now to the chaos, confusion and anger growing in the wake of President Trump's immigration ban. Overnight outrage from coast to coast. This is not about religion. This is about terror and keeping our country safe. There are over 40 different countries worldwide that are majority Muslim that are not affected by this order. What we did was we focused on, instead of religion, danger. The air areas of the world that create danger for us. Besides the opposition media, now that Donald Trump holds the most powerful seat in the world, he is faced with opposition from all sides. The Democrats, never Trumpers inside his own party, and the so-called deep state. You know, people call it the deep state or the administrative state or entrenched political class. These are the people who are making millions off the political system of the United States. Washington is a swamp, and it's filled with people, Republicans and Democrats, who don't have the country's best interests in mind. And these are the people who oppose Donald Trump. 
because he has his own people working against him. They're not part of the solution. They're part of the cabal, they're part of the swamp, and they're part of the problem. Trump needed the time to learn how the swamp worked. All of us want the swamp drained, but you cannot drain a swamp without actually knowing how it works first. And that's the same thing with progressivism. You can't pull it out by its root if you don't understand how it got there in the first place. The Democrats are suffering from a massive identity crisis and haven't been able to get their hands around the fact that they lost to Donald Trump, which has created a political vacuum in this country that the mainstream media has jumped in to fill. And they just can't get over the fact that they lost. So right after the election's over with, we start getting all these stories about Russian collusion. We can't really see anything of collusion. We are at a point where many people in the American public see this investigation uh, for what it is, a way to take down a president, and if it isn't collusion, they'll pivot to something else that has nothing to do with collusion, and the blind partisans, and particularly people in the media, will just run with that narrative. I mean, they have phony witch hunts going against me. They have everything going, and you know what? All we do is win, win, win. I don't think the people of the United States wanted an investigation. I think this was an investigation brought on by a conspiracy of people within the entrenched political class in Washington to get rid of Donald Trump. Now that I've been through my own sit down with the Mueller team, it becomes very obvious to me that this isn't about Russia collusion. It's about getting Donald Trump. Despite the media's desire to hype the Russian collusion narrative, Donald Trump has kept his focus and has managed to secure a number of important victories in less than two years. If you look at what this president has been able to achieve in the first year, historic tax cut, the repatriation of money sitting overseas, African-American unemployment, Hispanic unemployment, record lows because of what this president's policies are. He stayed laser focused on the things he said he would do, on the tough calls, on the Paris Climate Accord, on the Iran deal, on moving the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, on staring down the trade agreements that have been terrible for our country, on crushing ISIS. People didn't understand the importance of small business in this country. For 30 some odd years, nobody had really addressed the needs of these small business owners. Here we had an opportunity to make that change, and these small business owners needed that help to be able to actually make a change for their own businesses as well. Since the election, we have created 2.4 million new jobs. It's something I'm very proud of. African-American unemployment stands at the lowest rate ever recorded. <laughs> unemployment for Hispanics hit an all-time record low in June, and new polls showing that uh, Trump's approval rating among Hispanics rising rapidly. Not only because of the tax cuts, but because of the deregulation that he has forced through the stroke of his pen, he has removed the government boot off a small business's neck. We've seen big companies and small companies alike who are saying, because of the policies of this administration the first year and a half, we're growing our business. Our economy is moving in the right direction. That alone would be enough for any other president to secure a re-election right now. You couple that with the success that he's had in getting a Supreme Court justice on the court, more federal bench justices than any president in his tenure at this point ever in history. You look at the Conservative Heritage Foundation, they say, In his first year, uh, Donald Trump has done about 64% of our mandate for leadership. So we were quite encouraged. And for anyone who doubts whether or not we have a conservative president, we in fact do. I've been astonished to watch what it looks like when you see the speed of business versus the speed of government, the speed of action versus the speed of promises. Donald Trump is a businessman who has unleashed the climate of business in this country. He has said, I believe you know how to spend your money better than the government does. I want to cut your taxes so you can invest in your own lives. You can invest in your employees. You can invest in your business. I'm going to reduce regulations so that small business that doesn't have an army of accountants and lawyers and litigators and lobbyists, they're on a level playing field with those big guys that play very well and cozy inside the rigged system. But Donald Trump understands he wants equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. We can unleash the engines of capitalism. He has unleashed the miracle of free market economics because as a businessman, he understands that that's how you unleash the promise of America.
Today, I want to talk about how to grow the African-American middle class and to provide a new deal for black America. We are now seeing unemployment rates that are below 4%. And in fact, if you even look more specifically at unemployment rates amongst Latinos and amongst blacks, it is now at historic record levels in terms of lows. This is unbelievable. This administration, frankly, has done more for the Hispanic community, for the black community, than probably most other administrations have in the past. Well, at the beginning of the Obama years, especially within the black community, we were all excited that America had proven that it was able to get past this racist background. And we were excited about being able to elect the first black president. We thought for sure he would do things specifically to help the intrinsic and intransigent problems within the black community, the high unemployment rate, the black on black crime. Shooting violence has gotten so bad in Chicago that gunfights are breaking out now at existing crime scenes. And even with police in close proximity. We got shots fired over here. And then as he got settled into office, the cloud of disappointment began to settle in within the black community. Members of the Black Caucus could not get a meeting with the first black president, never addressed the black unemployment rate, and that's when the bottom fell out of our support for President Obama. And one of the things that unfortunately under the Obama administration, truly people believed that the American dream was dead. What the black community is looking for is a reason to change their habits. And I think that's part of the reason that President Donald Trump came onto the scene. Entrepreneurship, that's the bedrock, that's the gateway drug into the black community is through our entrepreneurs. And if we make sure we have a vibrant entrepreneurship class within the black community, that's going to go a long ways to solving a lot of the turmoil you see in the inner cities, number one. Then number two, education. Because if you have a good education and you're optimistic and hopeful, now you go to school, get education, whether it's college or vocational, then you have a, a, a flourishing entrepreneurs class that had a job waiting for you. They need you because their businesses are growing so fast. But now what we're hearing again, that optimism is sky high. People are investing back in their businesses because they believe that the American dream now is now achievable once again. That deal is grounded in three promises, safe communities, great education, and high-paying jobs. And the moment you reach out to them and you start taking them seriously as businessmen, you're going to see actual conservatism come into the picture, actual ideas come into the picture. I will also propose tax holidays for inner-city investment, a new tax incentive to get foreign companies to relocate in blighted American neighborhoods, and they will do that. It will be worthwhile. It's called incentive. They will do it. Uprooting progressivism and getting it out of our country so we're not on the brink of democratic socialism. I will produce and I will get others to produce. And we know for a fact it doesn't work with the Democrats. There's a lot at stake at this moment right now. And if Donald Trump chooses capitalism and chooses that fight at this moment, I think you change the entire trajectory of this country for what progressives have done the last hundred years. want to kill not only our civilians, all over the world. And it's going to be stopped. It's going to be stopped. Somebody criticized me the other day because they asked me what I'd do, and I said, I'm going to bomb the shit out of them. It's true. I don't care. I don't care. They've got to be stopped. The most underreported story of 2017 was the decimation of the caliphate that is ISIS in Syria and Iraq. 98% of that caliphate has now been destroyed. President Trump, as a candidate, said that we'll bomb the hell out of them, and he got ridiculed for that. 
Well, where are we now? We see a caliphate that's decimated, yet most people wouldn't even know that 98% of that caliphate is destroyed because simply it's not being reported. There have been hundreds of modern jihadi organizations that wished to bring back the caliphate that was dissolved after World War I. But every single one of them failed. All of them failed until a group called ISIS re-established the caliphate. President Obama warns that the fight against Islamic State will take time. The president went to the Pentagon for a briefing with the country's top military commanders. He called the fight against Islamic State a generational struggle. This will not be quick. This is a long-term campaign. ISIL is opportunistic and it is nimble. In many places in Syria and Iraq, including urban areas, it's dug in among innocent civilian populations. It will take time to root them out. Meaning your children, my grandchildren, would have to fight these jihadis decades from now. Donald J. Trump and his administration, with the focus on the physical caliphate, compressed Obama's generational war into the span of four months until the caliphate was no more. We've made tremendous strides, obviously, in Syria with ISIS. We've taken back virtually all of the caliphate, all of the land. Same thing in Iraq, and we're making tremendous strides. It's sort of the unwritten story right now. President Trump praising the news that ISIS has lost 98% of the territory at once held, with half of those victories coming since he took office. Just last year, ISIS controlled an area in Iraq and Syria the size of Ohio. Look at that on the map. Take a good look at it. And now we're going to show you what exists today. This is the remaining strongholds that are there, a small area along the border. So big accomplishment. I'll never forget seeing the black flag of ISIS fly over Fallujah, Ramadi, Samara, other towns that Americans had fought to liberate. And when we saw that, the images were jarring, but the response was infantile. Barack Obama called them the JV team. In January, President Obama told The New Yorker magazine's David Remnick that ISIS, which was then still considered a part of Al-Qaeda uh, fighting in Syria, was like a JV basketball team. We're not here to play games. We're not here to build schools. We're not here to hand out soccer balls. We're here to put a rifle round between the eyes of ISIS, to drop a Moab on their face and make sure they never come back to this earth. And here we are now, and the ISIS caliphate has been destroyed. That's the kind of leadership I want, is a commander-in-chief laser focused on destroying the enemy. Where are the front page headlines? Where are the deep dive stories about the lives that were saved? Where's the talk of the courage of Iraqis, of Kurds, of Syrians, of Americans, putting their life on the line so that ISIS dirtbags can be put into the dirt? Of course, those stories aren't told, because those stories would, would amplify the success of a commander-in-chief that this media hates. The Iranian regime is the leading state sponsor of terror. It exports dangerous missiles, fuels conflicts across the Middle East, and supports terrorist proxies and militias such as Hezbollah, Hamas, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda. Therefore, I am announcing today that the United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. The Iran deal is another example of the president making a promise. He said that this is the worst deal in history, that we're going to get out. Barack Obama was, it was more than foolish. He was reckless, ideologically reckless in America's security in pursuing that deal. They were foolish enough to think that if we gave the Iranians billions of dollars of pallets of cash, the uh, ayatollahs over there, the radical Islamists, would give up their nuclear weapons, stop their ambitions to chant death to America and wipe Israel off the map. Except everything we've seen since we signed that horrific deal is they've only funded their military operations more. They've only exported more Islamic terrorism in the region. They've only sought to expand their influence, undermine America, and undermine Israel in the process. And thank God we have a president who stepped up and said, 
That's not a deal worth making, let alone a deal worth keeping. America will not be held hostage to nuclear blackmail. We will not allow American cities to be threatened with destruction. And we will not allow a regime that chants death to America to gain access to the most deadly weapons on Earth. Today's action sends a critical message. The United States no longer makes empty threats. When I make promises, I keep them. The new provocation from North Korea, what could be the most dangerous yet, a new missile launched being called a breakthrough, a successful test of an intercontinental ballistic missile, possibly capable of reaching Alaska. North Korea's official statement celebrating the launch, promising to root out what they see as the U.S. threat. If you remember August of 2017, we were on the verge of World War III. North Korea was lobbing missiles over Japan, was threatening Guam, had nuclear capabilities, and the president said that Kim Jong-un and the North Korean people will be met with a fire and fury like the world has never seen. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself for its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. The media was apocalyptic, said you can't speak to North Korean leaders like that. You can't use that sort of language. You're going to get us into a war. And instead, it was a language, it turns out, that Kim Jong-un actually understood. And he began to acquiesce. And he began to stop testing missiles. North Korea will not find security and respect through threats and illegal weapons. We will work with our friends and allies to stand up to this behavior, and we will redouble our efforts toward a more robust international non-proliferation regime that all countries have responsibilities to meet. They accelerated toward a nuclear bomb under the Obama administration because they saw it as their opportunity. Ironically, that's the number one issue Barack Obama said he was handing to Donald Trump to solve on the world stage. And what has President Trump done? He's forged a path to solve it. But he didn't play by the consensus games of Washington, D.C. Never once did intelligentsia crowd say, you know what you should do? You should tell Kim Jong-un fire and fury is coming his way. You should tell Kim Jong-un he's going to get a bloody nose if he tries it again. You should ramp up troop deployments, ramp up military exercises, maximize the pressure, utilize China to put pressure on North Korea. And here we are. We're getting actual action on the Korean Peninsula. And now we have all sides talking, and people are talking about Donald Trump, of all people, winning a Nobel Peace Prize. Republican Congressman Luke Messer launching an effort to nominate President Trump for a Nobel Peace Prize. That could end up being his legacy. That could end up being his biggest accomplishment as president if he is actually able to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. in the Kate Steinle murder case, the illegal immigrant Garcia Zarate, who killed Kate Steinle on that pier in San Francisco, was acquitted just a short time ago of murder and manslaughter charges. When Donald Trump took that escalator down in Trump Tower, as soon as he honed in on immigration, I knew that he was speaking to an America that had been told that they weren't allowed to talk about these issues, that they were verboten, that they, they had to be censored in public discourse for the sake of social cohesion. Donald Trump was having none of it. Donald Trump stood on that stage and said some of the most extraordinary and true and revelatory things about mass migration. But I speak to border guards and they tell us what we're getting. And it only makes common sense. It only makes common sense. They're sending us not the right people. It's coming from more than Mexico. It's coming from all over South and Latin America, and it's coming probably, probably from the Middle East. Let me tell you something the mainstream media will never tell you tonight. It was San Francisco sanctuary city policies that killed Kate Steinle. Our campaign was outlined immigration, and that means stopping illegal immigrants from coming into the country. The notion of a wall on the southern border, which had been proposed years before that the Senate had voted on, including Hillary, you know, secure our borders with technology, personnel, uh, physical barriers if necessary. Was now a controversial idea? It's absurd. 
When we went out to the American people, and the president started talking about bringing our jobs back. Under the Obama years, those jobs were decimated, and he promised to bring those manufacturing jobs back because middle America had been left behind. We will bring our jobs back, Sean. We're gonna bring our jobs, as sure as you're sitting there, we are gonna bring our jobs back into this country for the first time. If we don't have a wall, we don't have a country. And if you don't have a border, you will have a perpetual problem exploited by the worst of the worst, by MS-13 by drug runners, by sex traffickers, by violent gangs. All of these groups who have created problems across our country that then left-wing politicians give sanctuary to. Reaffirming its reputation as the sanctuary city of all sanctuary cities, San Francisco is doubling down on its defiance of federal immigration law. To me, the border wall is as close to an immigration litmus test as there exists. Find me a politician and ask them what they think about the border wall. And if they say, well, maybe we need it, maybe we don't, they still don't get the idea of immigration today. They still don't get the idea of a nation state. They still don't understand how central it is to the future of our country. People who really don't believe America should have borders, people who see immigration as simply a factor of production, who see immigrants as future Social Security taxpayers and nothing else, People who don't send their kids to public schools where 14 or 17 languages have to be taught, and the Latin kings are battling it out with MS-13 over the turf and driving out African Americans whose ancestors have been there for 100 years. America has never been a race, a gender, uh, a, a social class. It is a set of ideas that we have perpetuated, but it starts with the rule of law. Without the rule of law, everything else falls apart. Without the rule of law starting on our border, we don't have a country. When I talk with a lot of my friends in the Congressional Black Caucus privately, I chastise them, how can you be black and you're supporting amnesty for those in the country illegally, when then at the same time you complain about the high unemployment rate in the black community, so your solution is to bring in cheap labor? Really? The black folks I talk to, do not support amnesty for illegal. Even most of the black liberal democratic staffers I know and talk to, privately, they don't agree with it. But they are terrified to go public and say they disagree with it. Why pay an American engineer $150,000 a year when you can import them and pay them $80,000 a year? We need to get back to putting Americans first and not worry about trying to be president of the world, which we had eight years of that. Now we have a president that's singularly focused on, if it's good for America, then it's good for the world. That's a total paradigm shift. What President Trump is doing with this issue of illegal immigration is resonating in the black community. What we have to do is do a better job of giving these people a microphone to talk about how they feel about that issue. I don't believe there's a bigger geopolitical issue that threatens American security directly than the rise of China. America is the most powerful nation the world has ever seen on every metric. Nevertheless, there is one nation that has both the desire and the potential to displace us. They see their culture as better than anybody else's, and they see the last hundred years as an anomaly as a humiliation by the West. What we have today is a, a modern day economic superpower. The Chinese today are becoming more communist. Uh, they're becoming more oppressive at home. They're becoming more expansionist internationally. China's goal is to diminish the United States at all costs because China's rise and ultimately China's world domination is to make sure that the United States is defeated. And they're doing everything in their power by using information means as well as supporting America's enemies, stealing America's technology. The amounts that have been stolen by the Chinese have just been extraordinary in the trillions of dollars of valuable U.S. technology. And they're using that technology to build up their military as well as their diplomatic, economic, and intelligence infrastructures. Once you work in the White House, once you have access to the intelligence that the most powerful intelligence community in the world can provide, you tend to see things differently. I came to realize that the only truly strategic long-term threat that America faces is in fact from China. China has a plan to displace us. 
by the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Revolution in 2049. 2049 is 100th anniversary of Chinese People's Republic of China. In the 2021, they want territory integrity, which means they want Taiwan, they want South China Sea. And then in 2049, they want to overtake the United States. The flashpoints between the United States and China are clearly uh, in the Pacific. The South China Sea, which sees five trillion in trade annually, has been militarized and literally taken over by the Chinese in a covert operation to build small islets throughout the sea and begin militarizing them with missiles. Any of these three flashpoints could erupt into a regional conflict unless the United States takes major action to push back against this Chinese hegemonism. Mr. Xi, for years, he was a very cautious guy. He understood how to climb up in China. To be climb up in the communist ladder, you first you have to be harmless. People are not afraid of you. You're not in anybody's way. But when he got to power, now he's showing his true color. We see him using Mao's language. We see him raise issues like what Mao raised. Xi Jinping come from a veteran family. Both his parents are communist high-ranking leaders. He grew up in that environment. So when he come to power, he has a mission to defend, to restore, revive the Communist Party, make it become a, a, a stronger, uh, uh, glorify the Communist Party. China is definitely a totalitarian regime uh, because it controls everything. China is control everybody's thinking, everybody's social behavior, and everybody's speech, and not a single uh, regime in the history can have such a tool to control over its people. The totalitarian machine, the whole country is a police state. They have developed a strategy, the One Belt, One Road strategy, and they've developed a doctrine called unrestricted warfare to undermine us in indirect ways, specifically economic warfare and political warfare and the development of military technologies that leapfrog over conventional military technology development. It's actually a stalking horse for the Chinese ideology of Chinese communism, socialism with Chinese characteristics. They're building up countries around the world, and with that comes the Chinese economic model as well as the Chinese authoritarian and communist system. And the United States, again, is at a loss to try and counter this. China basically has no oil, and therefore they're heavily dependent on Middle Eastern oil, so they're looking for ways to control the oil coming out of the Persian Gulf and the Middle East and make sure that they can secure that. I think President Trump perhaps is one of the smartest presidents we have. And his engagement with China, I think as a businessman, first he understands personal relationship. He made President Xi said one thing, is that the United States of America have a thousand reasons to be friendly to each other, have zero reason not to be friendly. Actually, we have plenty of reason to be not friendly, but President Trump established a personal relationship. In the Chinese politics, if you have a personal relationship, you can always, you know, have some leeway. On the other hand, if you don't stand firm for your national interests, they despise you. So actually, President Trump won a lot of respect from the Chinese leaders and Chinese people. We've lost 70,000 factories since China joined the World Trade Organization. And you've seen that, you've heard about it. 70,000, the World Trade Organization, another one of our disasters. But this election, the American people voted to end the theft of American prosperity. They voted to bring back their jobs and to bring back their dreams into our country. That's why I'm here today. In just a few moments, I will be signing a Buy American and Hire American executive order. You haven't heard about that in a long time in this country. With this action, we are sending a powerful signal to the world. We're going to defend our workers, protect our jobs, and finally, Put America first. Donald Trump was one of the first politicians to recognize the threat from China. He broke with the uh, business community and that he wasn't going to go along with business as usual 
by ignoring China's aggression in the South China Sea and other areas, ignoring China's human rights abuses. Donald Trump has made a sea change in the U.S. approach to China. He's made China the top threat along with Russia. He has made protecting American economic security one of the highest priorities. Again, this trade and interaction in the past was based on the false notion that trading with China would have a moderating influence on its behavior. And President Trump was the first to recognize that this has totally failed and that a much tougher approach is needed. We're going to be fulfilling another campaign promise by taking firm steps to ensure that we protect the intellectual property of American companies and, very importantly, of American workers. No, mark my words. If the 21st century is not an American century, the 21st century will not be a free century. And I'll tell you this, the Chinese, the communists, believe the future is theirs that their economy and its central planning is the future, that their military will eventually overtake America's. And they, they do not believe that our will is strong enough to confront them. They believe America is a declining power, that free peoples and capitalism inevitably implodes, and that central planning and dictatorship and communism is the way of the people. If we do not stare down China, not just on trade, but on their military ambitions. The 21st century could be a Chinese century, and that means it's, it sure is not a free one. The deplorables know that they've been doing the heavy lifting for a long time. They're the guys from the small towns across America whose parents have the nine to five jobs, make just enough to get them off to college, but infuse in them the values that matter the most. Love your country, be willing to fight for things greater than yourself, earn a paycheck because there's dignity in work, and you know, raise a family that perpetuates that into the next generation, that loves America. So the, the deplorable said, the way I give to my country is to give the way the previous generation did. You know, in November, we have so much actually at stake, so much to lose. The Democrats, they actually are saying, vote for us and we will raise your taxes. What can you do but raise taxes? You're used to hearing the Democrats say, vote for us, we'll give you free stuff here and free stuff there. Our small business owners right now, their optimism is sky high because they believe that these are the tax cuts that they're going to be facing in the future. But I'll tell you now that we're hearing a little bit of concern now because they're asking the question, what happens if they go away? You raised the issue of taxes. Trump raised that issue. Let's talk about it. What's too high for the top personal rate? It's, it's not about a number. That's what negotiations are all about. Says, what rate? Yes, we are going to end these. We'll come up with that rate, but it'll be a damn lot higher than it is right now. This is Armageddon. It's 50% obviously too high? Look, there was a time in a very prosperous America where the top marginal rate was well above 50%. Previously, you'd been asked if a 90% marginal rate is certainly too high, and you said no. So how high are you willing to go? Not one Democrat voted to cut taxes. Not one. And just as I promised the American people from this podium 11 months ago, we enacted the biggest tax cuts and reforms in American history. The November 2018 elections are absolutely critical to see this president's agenda continue to move forward. This election, if it is an election about the success that our country is facing, Donald Trump wins and the Republicans keep and expand their majorities both in the Senate and the House. If this is a localized election where the Democratic candidates are running away from Nancy Pelosi and the leadership of the Democratic Party, then the Democrats are going to do very well. We have come up with a lot of solutions, but we have Democrats that don't want to approve anything because that's probably, they think, bad for the election that's coming up. What Democrats are very good at doing is they go into their districts, they campaign and say one thing, they come to Washington, D.C., and they do the exact opposite. That's what is on trial. That is what we are talking about for the November election. Donald Trump is definitely on the ballot in every race across the country. You're either with an agenda, a reform agenda of Washington that is with the people to make government smaller and more effective and to return more money to the pockets of the American taxpayer, or you're with those in the Beltway that want to grow government, grow the size of its regulation, and to keep imposing itself on our lives. Tell me what the Democrats are running on. What's their platform relative to the black community? Just think about the impact of voting 
Democrat and having several prominent black liberals chairing major committees. If you don't think elections matter, all I say is when you wake up this morning, think of Chairman Maxine Waters chairing the Financial Services Committee. That should scare you to vote Republican right there. I don't think there's been a, a midterm election this important uh, in my lifetime. Uh, because the Democrats want to take us back to taxes and to the regulatory state and, and largely the politicization of everything, okay? One of the reasons the economy is doing well now is because the president is getting the boot of government off the necks of business people and farmers and people that make things, grow things, and build things. And the government released its gross domestic product report for the second quarter this morning. It showed the U.S. economy grew 4.1% from April through June. That's the best showing since 2014. The Democratic Party of America have wasted the first year and a half of the Trump presidency attacking him on nonsensical issues because they think, firstly, they control the media. They think, secondly, they control the culture. And so their ideas will pervade, their ideas will filter down necessarily, no matter what. They don't rule the roost. They have no answers. So they resorted to racist and xenophobe and all these other things. The Democrats have nothing to run on in November. What platform do they have? Are they going to vote on, let's bring ISIS back? Let's get rid of the five million job bonuses that have been created by the tax reform. Shall we not build the wall? They can't run on this. The 2016 election was a peaceful political revolution, and it was historic. I have a whole list of uh, accomplishments that the group behind me have done in terms of this administration and this Congress, but uh, you've heard it before. We are making America great again. But 2018 is even more important than the election of the president. The whole Make America Great Again agenda relies upon seven more years of this administration being able to bring us back to where we should be. So yes, without a doubt, this election cycle is about the highest stakes possible for our nation. There is a lot at stake in November for the American public, and it really comes down to one question, which is, who do you actually best believe deserves to make the choice for you? Do you make the choice for yourself, or do you allow the government to actually make the choice for you? 2018 is another election about Donald Trump. What they want to do is shut up the deplorables. They want to shut you up, because you know what? They're scared of him. They are scared of what he's done. They're scared of the economy that he's created. It scares them that our allies in the world love us and trust us more than ever because they were supposed to hate this president, according to the elite media. They are terrified of President Trump because they're terrified of you and your values. There's a new Gallup poll that shows President Trump's rating are on the rise, and 90% of the fact of his party supports the president. That's the second highest rating in, in modern history for the GOP. What is glaringly obvious is that the left and the opposition party in the media, they do not have any answers against the Make America Great Again agenda. They don't have any policy solutions. They know that Trump is on the rise out there in the polls because he's doing what he was elected to do. He's delivering jobs, he's securing the border, he's even his foreign policy, probably the greatest foreign policy we've seen in decades. 2018, therefore, represents a vote for Donald Trump or a vote for impeachment of Donald Trump, because they cannot defeat this agenda at the ballot box. Impeach 45! Impeach 45! If the Democrats win in midterms, they are going to go after Donald Trump for impeachment. The only thing they can run on is hatred and the impeachment of the president. It is a foregone conclusion that if they lose the House and the Senate, impeachment proceedings will begin almost instantly. We have some real big issues that we're going to be losing on. One is infrastructure, which was another big campaign promise. Building the wall is going to be imperiled. And depending on what happens in the Senate, the whole uh, judicial nomination could come to a complete and grinding stop. We're going to have some Supreme Court vacancies that are going to determine the future of this country for the next 50 to 60 years. Those are critical nominations, and they need to get confirmed by the Senate when they're made. And if we lose, if the Democrats take the Senate as well, we're going to lose all those judicial nominations. And that's why we must do everything in our power to block this appointment. Let's take a page out of Mitch McConnell's book, 
and not have a vote on this until the midterm elections. If they take the House, we will have a divided, impotent government where nothing gets accomplished. It, it will be ugly and horrible, even beyond the ludicrous and dishonest impeachment hearings, which manifestly corrupt Democrats will be conducting in the full light of day with everyone knowing that it's purely a partisan exercise. I don't respect this president. I don't trust this president. He's not working in the best interest of the American people. His motives and his actions are contemptible. And I will fight every day until he is impeached. We have to keep the House. Because if you listen to Maxine Waters, she goes around saying, we will impeach him. We will impeach him. Then people said, but he hasn't done anything wrong. It's time for his agenda to be enacted fully. And we need the midterm elections to stay with the Republicans for that agenda to continue. Otherwise, you're going back to more regulation, more taxes, and more state control from an Obama-Clinton approach to government. Going out in 2018 is like going out in 2016 or going out in 2020. This is a referendum as to whether or not the forgotten man will be remembered and whether or not the deplorables will still be heard. And whether or not we live in a system where a duly elected president is allowed to do his job. The president is unstoppable. What he did when he ran for president wasn't done for money and wasn't done for fame. He will never give up, but he's only one man. For the last 30 years, our nation has been covered in an ice blanket of political correctness that froze solid the media, the arts, and politics. We allowed that blanket to fall. But then, two years ago, along came a man, the kryptonite of political correctness. I will always put America first. And like an ice-breaking ship, he slammed into that ice and broke a pathway and freed that sea lane up. But if you understand the physics of ice breaking, when that tungsten hull rides down on that ice and breaks it free, if you don't have a flotilla of ships that comes in right behind the icebreaker, in real life, what happens? The ice comes around the bow, around the hull of the ship, and then almost instantaneously re knits itself and closes off that waterway. America must create the flotilla. Every single person who is proud of what has been achieved must come to be part of that flotilla and to be what the military calls a force multiplier for the president. The stakes of the next election are even bigger than the one that changed the face of the nation 